woman's red sari runs in rivulets across her hips, catching the sunlight. On a street corner, at the break of dawn, I watch a Sikh taxi driver unfurl the turban from his head, loop after loop of saffron orange cloth. He dips his long hair into a rusty tin bucket, lathering and rinsing, the bubbles frothing like sea foam between his fingers, and when he sits up straight, his hair falls like shimmering black velvet down his back. I have never seen such beauty. There is nothing pretty about him. And then the morning sun hits my eyes as bright and unapologetic as Lyle's platinum curls. Thank you. Poe Ballantyne is the author of two essay collections, two novels, and the forthcoming nonfiction book, Love and Terror on the Howling Plains of Nowhere. His writing has appeared in Best American Essays and Best American Short Stories, and he's the subject of the recent documentary, Poe Ballantyne, A Writer in America. Poe. Uh, it's wonderful to be here at the Heartland Cafe. Thank you for having us. Uh, this is a story called The Irving. I'm going to dedicate it to all those people in the kitchen back there where I spent a lot of time myself. And Adam, too, wherever you are, 14 years on the line. Uh, i got to take my glasses off. So. In the small Nebraska town where I live, I am known as The Cook. Even people I don't know will often stare at me fuzzily for a moment before that relieved flash of recognition. Hey, I know you, you're the cook. Which is reasonable enough, I suppose, since I am the cook. It isn't exactly what I've dreamed of all my life, however. Actually, being a cook is a sort of unpleasant byproduct of all my efforts to be the writer. <laughs> but recently, out of the blue, I was invited to a literary festival held in Portland, Oregon called Wordstock, in which I was to be the writer, a small fry flitting through the nets after the big ones were already landed, yes. And then, of course, my publisher, who'd arranged a dinner for Russell Banks, thought I should be the cook, but I was flattered nonetheless. Not long after I had bought a blazer from a thrift store for 16 bucks, I don't think it looked too bad. It was rust brown. I hadn't one worn, one worn, worn one for 20 years, and it's got toothpaste on it now, so I can't wear it anymore. <laughs> I began to formulate a plot to punch a celebrity in the nose. If you only get a chance to make a splash every 10 or 15 years, you should make a big splash. Norman Mailer was slated to appear at this festival along with Russell Banks, as I said, John Irving, Alice Siebold, uh, Jean Owl selling her cans of Cave Bear or her caved in beer cans or whatever they were, <laughs> and many other authors I didn't particularly admire. The publishing business is as stuffy and fickle as any other form of show business built on name recognition. Can you hear me all right? Is, am I speaking properly into this contraption? The publishing business is as stuffy and fickle as any other form of show business built on name recognition, cronyism, aggressive agents, formula titillation, what sold yesterday, and the most bulldogged, tawdry, and shameless stunts the PR team can dream up. If you believe the blurbs, there are more geniuses working today in the publishing business than in the Renaissance, the Jazz Age, and the Manhattan Project all put together. Uh, quote literature, unquote, with the help of the academies and the knit browed and cold hearted literary journals has come to be agreed upon by the general public as something akin to vitamins, dry and difficult to swallow, but good for us somehow. <laughs> Which is one of the many reasons I've never finished school. I've always thought that literature should be interesting, funny if possible, not lighthearted or insubstantial or in want of nutrition by any means, but built top to bottom to be read. The crafty magpies who captain American industry have a bottom line to think of, however, and they know what makes the mayor go. They understand that most people don't drink beer, they drink advertising. They don't drive cars, they drive advertising. They don't vote for a candidate 
candidate, they vote for advertising. Books are no different. You have to tell people what they want. Otherwise, you'll have to actually make a product that isn't Budweiser, Chevrolet, or George W. Bush. <laughs> As long as America clings to the primacy of fame and surrenders its reality to the designers of mass cult consumption, this is how it will remain. If readers got the notion that books should actually be interesting, not difficult, dry, or ambiguous, who knows what kind of calamities might befall the economy. There are 40,000 magazines to fill, a new novel published every half an hour, MFAs hatching like mayflies. Why? Why tantalize consumers with red mangoes when all you've got is canned corn? <laughs> My plot began to run, run along these lines. Everyone, us anyway, the have-nots, who make up 90% of the population, loves a revolution, a big party, free stuff, a chance to get out of the house, get off work, the stiff, stale, and corrupt falling under the wheels of progress, the illusion of change, new blood rising to the top. Let's kick all the stuffed lions down the stairs and shovel these old mastodon carcasses to the side of the road. Boston Tea Party, Martin Luther, Madame Lafarge, down with Tsarist Russia, leave your vodka though, and why shouldn't I be the one to light the fuse? So I reckon that if I punched Norman Mailer in the nose at some high-profile event, just stepped up to the podium and laid him flat, camera bulbs popping as he had done to Gore Vidal many years ago, or so the legend goes, maybe I could pave the way for the new regime. I'm talking about us again, you and me, the rejected, jilted, oppressed, ignored, got off the, to a late start, the small fries, can't land an agent, missed the boat prodigies, the unknown geniuses, the readers who spend all day at the library and can't find a single thing to read except by biographies of Thomas Jefferson, no offense there, Andrew, uh, and exposés of Ronald Reagan's hemorrhoids. The have-nots, give the unlucky another roll of the dice. Get out of the way, you old dust bags. Us. I wrote this about ten years ago, and now I'm an old dust bag. <laughs> I understood that Norman was old, 82. Several of my friends wrote me before I left. Is he still alive? <laughs> but this was an even better reason to, keep, to help him along. He'd recently been paid $2.5 million from the University of Texas for 900 boxes of crap. Did I say crap? I meant papers. Range, <laughs> ranging from manuscripts to canceled checks to car repair bills. Car repair? Repair bills? Imagine being able to sell your fucking car repair bills. With love and trepidation, he sold his car repair bills for 2.5 million smackers. Think of how many interesting writers 2.5 million dollars could support. The old fossil deserved a pop. And he'd, and he'd gotten to bray about his bloated opinions for 50 years. Granted, he's a monument intellectual who writes well about murder and war, but he has the soul of a Korean alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> what, what beauty has he wrought? How many times has he made me laugh or filled me with the wonder of being human? He's as dry as leftover turkey. He'll be utterly forgotten by next Monday. And I thought, even if I never achieve acclaim as a man of letters, I will no longer be known as the cook. <laughs> but as the guy who punched the Utex car bill dust bag and started the revolution, our novels no longer weigh four pounds or read like car repair bills thanks to Poe Ballantyne. P.S. Hope you get out of federal prison soon. <laughs> But then, just before my flight reservations were confirmed, I learned that I would be opening for John Irving. I was awestruck, and it certainly had to be a fluke, but it was apparently not a fluke. The event was going to be televised by C-SPAN. The incredible blue sky news continued, and thousands of people would not only attend, but pay to attend. And John Irving is a pop star, Captain Quirk, fluffy as the whipped pink sugar at the county fair. He opens supposedly serious novels with sentences like, in the hospital of the orphanage, the boys' division at St. Cloud's, Maine, two nurses were in charge of naming the new babies and checking that their little penises were healing from the obligatory circumcision. <laughs> Captain Quirk has learned the art of keeping his readers' attention with penises and spilled semen and women filleting horses. Piggy Sneed and Owen Meany indeed. No destiny had stepped in to direct me, punching an 82-year-old man who had spoken out early and vehement, uh, vehemently against the Vietnam War, even if he's one of the great sand dunes of our era, would get me no sympathy at all. 
Quirk was my man, and I was going to be on stage with him, live cameras rolling the revolution like a spark in the tight darkness of my right fist. True, Irving was an accomplished wrestler, a man still very fit for 63, <laughs> but he'd never know what hit him. I'd be in jail with my name splashed across the national papers before he was out of the dentist's chair. Who is this Poe Ballantyne? Who is this cheesy stunt artist, this sociopathic public relations hound, this brazen hypocritical anarchist? And what are the names of his books? Yes, we're going to read this dazzling rogue, this bo <laughs> This bodacious young Turk, this delectably lawless scoundrel, will buy anyone who embarrasses himself publicly, who sucks off a president, who plagiarizes for a major newspaper, who cheats at sports or business, who kills people for a living. Rhonda, my publisher, met me at the Portland airport, a busy, lean, energetic brunette of 40 years with hip 50s looking wing spec she makes her money at a, as a print broker and then fritters it away on people like me. She printed 5,000 copies of my first book, for example, and it must have sold 2,000 copies. She laughed when I told her my plan. She thought it was a good idea. <laughs> She thought I was joking, of course. All the better for a surprise, I thought, doing little patty cakes in my mind. Every one of the books on her list would soar up the charts. We'd be like death row records, swaggering brigands with samurai tattoos and our own special hand signals. The public so frightened they'd just have to call us artists. She'd She'd have to bail me out of jail, yes, but what small price is that to pay for success? And even the modest, upright people would soon forget how I snaked my way into the, lim the limelight. I stayed with my publisher in her fabulous ninth floor corner loft overlooking downtown Portland and the Willamette, the Willamette River. I've been corrected on that before. On clear days, though, her green glass, through her green glass walls you can see Mount Hood, the Cascades, and the fumatory Mount St. Helens. After I threw all my stuff into the storage room where I would sleep, Rhonda said, let's go get something to eat. I am not going to drink, though, she added. This is what she always says. But she was right this time. We had a busy week ahead. The big reading, the Irving, as she had begun to call it, was tomorrow. We walked down the street to the Rogue for hamburgers. One beer with a hamburger is not drinking, so we had just one more pint. And then we went down the block for habanero martinis. Have you ever tried those? <laughs> they don't have them where I'm from. Vodka infused with habanero peppers shaken with pineapple juice over ice and poured fizzing into a martini glass rimmed with sugar. Not exactly a martini, but speaking of brazen public exhibitions, Quite the little punch in the kisser. Let's have another. We were glowing by the time we got home and decided to drink wine, and finally we got to bed about two that morning. I slept on a futon surrounded by books, many of them mine, boxes and boxes of unsold books by the cook <laughs> in that dark storage room with its exposed ducts and roaring central air fan. It was as dark as the cave of a clan bear in there. Uh, I couldn't see anything, not even the clock. I had to feel my way for the light switch. It was terrific, utter peace. I felt like a lion in its lair. In the morning, I was badly hung over with tachycardia that convinced me I would die before I ever got the chance to slug anyone. I slept in late. I don't normally drink much, but how many days out of the year do I get to be the writer? And how long before I'd be sent to a place where cocktails were prohibited? <laughs> When my heart stopped thrashing around, I had to concentrate on how I would punch John Irving. Left-handed, right, straight jab, uppercut. Give him the slight warning. Perhaps make it an arrange arrangement with him so he could dive. I didn't want to hurt him. I only want needed to articulate the symbol, supply the image. Later, I would be interviewed, be labeled crazy or whatever. But I'd tell them, just what I'm telling you, literature is fusty, it's clogged, it's anal, it's winded, it's fading, it's lost its heart, it's rehash, it's a cottage industry built around the creative writing programs, it's too many goddamn historical novels, it's this third-generation immigrant 
immigrant writing, quote, humorously about the Holocaust, or this, quote, talented New York prodigy blowing bagpipes about his supposedly daring life. In music, you're only as good as your last hit. In literature, one decent selling book, and we have to listen to you until they zip the coffin shut. <laughs> Or you sell your 900 boxes of crap at the door of the rest home. <laughs> I'm just doing my part. I'm, I'm just trying to clear the way for the ones who belong here, the ones who have something to say, the ones who are willing to give more than their, quote, talent, unquote. The ones who have gambled and lived. Once I recovered my normal heartbeat, took a shower and drank a beer, I started getting nervous. <laughs> In a few hours, I would be reading in a giant hall in front of 2,000 people, and then I was going to make a spectacle of myself, crack the plaster into that frightening chasm of anarchy in front of gentle, left-wing, mostly passive, scholastic people, the same ones who had started the last few American revolutions. <laughs> I practiced the piece I would read in my introduction. Thank you for putting up with me. I'm flattered to be your weenie roll-ups, your REO speed wagon. Nathaniel West said, forget the epic, forget the masterwork. In America, fortunes do not accumulate. The soil does not grow. Families have no history. Leave slow growth to the book reviewers. You only have time to explode. Remember William Carlos Williams's description of the pioneer women who shot their children against the wilderness like cannonballs. Do the same with your novels. My young friend Mr. Scott Nadelson, another meager selling Hawthorne books writer, a gloomy well-dressed man of 30 years, no thrift stores for Scott, who lives and teaches in Portland and would go first among the three warm-up readers, came over about 5 p.m. and we drank some 15-year-old scotch to loosen up. The reading was at 7 p.m. We had to be there by 6.30 p.m. What are you going to read? I said, half a story, he said gloomily. You know my stories are so long. You? My dead guy chapter. Oh, that's a good one. More scotch? Just a touch. <laughs> it wasn't enough. That pinch seemed to evaporate before it got to my lips. Oh, how I suddenly dreaded this night. I couldn't tell Scott about my plan. He didn't like Irving either, but he had recently won an Oregon Book Award. He had no need for cheap stunts. I finished my scotch. I began to feel like a bad actor. I began to feel like John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> At six o'clock, a troop of us, writers, editors, husbands, and wives of, strolled across town through the wind, all joking with nervous smiles and our snappy duds into the biggest night of our small-time literary lives. My plan had grown complicated. First, Irving was flying in late. He would not even hear his warm-ups read. He would stroll in just in time to comb his hair and have his hand kissed, read, answer a few questions, attend his $50 admission party, and be off again through the ticker tape to the powdered rosy anuses of high society. Second, the warm-up authors would read 15 minutes each and then exit the staging area, leaving us effectively partitioned from him as he probably requested, sensing a revolution in the wings. <laughs> To get to Irving in the spotlight, I'd have to sneak and then lurk backstage or come leaping out from the audience at some point, maybe jump down from the balcony as Booth had done. At least they would know who I was when they saw me. Hey, that's the guy who read earlier, the writer. <laughs> I thought of the headlines in the paper of my small town, Cook Attacks Beloved Writer. <laughs> The Keller Auditorium is a ballet and opera hall, children's theater, etc., that seats almost 3,000. Mr. Scott and I were led to the green room backstage. Scott informed me that most green rooms are not really green. I imagine they call them green after the complexions of their occupants, which is certainly how I felt. There were a number of people already present, writers, sponsors, organizers, a couple of introducers, a photographer, and the MC. I shook hands and in introduced myself all around. This was my first time in a green room, my first time on TV, my first time meeting someone famous, though I had once seen Roger Mudd from a car window in DC, and my first time reading to more than 30 or 40 people. 
I checked my bookmarks and internally mumbled my introduction. I chatted with the people backstage, especially the MC, a friendly guy from Oregon Public Broadcasting who with his fedora and beard reminded me of the great Bukowski. Mostly I had to explain why I was from Nebraska. <laughs> I like Nebraska. Actually, I explained to them I can afford to live there, for instance. The air is very clean. The people are all broke like me, and except for calling me the cook, they are congenial and often even helpful. I could have talked all day about Nebraska, but it was plain that no one believed me. The clock struck 7 p.m. The hour had finally arrived. The MC strolled out and set up the first introducer who fished about for laughs, finally found some, began to enjoy himself, and seemed to stay too long. That was all right. Each extra minute he spent out there meant one less minute of suffering for me. Then someone said two minutes, and Scott, looking drained, tugged at his shirt button and was led away as if to his execution. Fifteen minutes, I thought, and it will be my turn. Everyone says the same thing when it's their turn. What about tomorrow or next week instead? I watched Scott read on the monitor in the green room. The shot was from afar, fuzzy, small, and barely visible. Typical C-SPAN. It's actually what I like about C-SPAN. The whole notion of production is secondary to the event. I concentrated on Scott and his reading. He was doing well. He was used to this. He read dozens of times every year to various audiences. He just wrapped up his, this book award and had gone on a big tour to large audiences all across the country, including New York City and women throwing their room keys at him. I hadn't read much, usually open mic with all the other unrecognized geniuses after the professors and the paid guests had strolled back home. I was beginning to get shaky. I wondered if I would get sick. I wondered if my heart would go haywire again. I glanced at Scott on the monitor. I calculated about eight minutes before my turn. And then John Irving entered the room. I was too busy trying to get my breathing under control to devote much attention to him. I sat there with my book in my lap. Everyone leaped to their feet. I had expected him to be somewhat arrogant. Instead, he was gracious and mild. He seemed patient and wise. He didn't seem at all like a man who would indiscriminately use the word penis to keep his reader's attention. He wore a green shirt and light suit coat. Every